Um, so uh, what I thought I'd do today to start off today's agenda is to just briefly go over um, the, uh, the summary of a paper that we put out recently at the Center for Security Policy on uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, also known as drones, uh, and the use of force abroad. And just a quick note on terminology. Um, moving forward, I'm only going to use the term UAV, or unmanned aerial vehicle. The military guys told me repeatedly that drone is the wrong term to describe these things. So uh, I may occasionally revert back to the word drone, but um, for present purposes, it's UAV. Uh, there is a. RPV or RPA. Yeah, that's right. But, they, but, but, but the Air Force assured me that UAV was also an accurate term. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, use that term for today. Um, there is a copy of the executive summary of this paper. It should be one in front of each chair. Uh, the real paper is about 100 pages with about 230 footnotes or so. It's available at our website. Um, but uh, for those of you who may not have time to look at that, please feel free to look at the executive summary. So I think it's especially appropriate that I discuss our paper on this at Heritage because two of Heritage's finest scholars, Steve Bucci, who you're going to hear from later, and also Steve Groves, who's uh, one of the, the foremost experts in Washington on international law and international treaties, uh, figure prominently in this paper. Uh, and I'm grateful to them for the opportunities I had to interview them at length on the subject of unmanned aerial vehicles uh, and how we use them abroad. Uh, so. As I was preparing for today's lunch earlier this week, uh, news came out that the leader of the Pakistan Taliban, Hakimullah Massoud, was killed in a UAV strike in the North Waziristan region of Pakistan. Now, according to news sources, uh, Massoud was linked to the failed attempt at the bombing of Times Square in 2010 uh, and was also behind the 2009 suicide bombing attack on forward operating base Chapman in coast Afghanistan, uh, in which seven Americans were killed. Days earlier, a UAV strike in Somalia killed a key al-Shabaab operative there, Ibrahim al-Abdi, although news reports have not linked him personally to the September attack on the mall in Nairobi, Kenya, al-Shabaab had claimed responsibility for that attack, as we all know. I mentioned these recent strikes to underscore the point that UAV strikes have been successful uh, in taking out leaders and operatives of international terrorist organizations like al-Qaeda and its associated forces. But their success in this area notwithstanding, uh, the debate continues inside and outside of D.C. about the legality of targeting terrorists abroad, as the Obama administration has using UAVs, uh, and the policy advisability of doing so. So the question of whether these strikes carry costs that outweigh the benefits despite their success rate. Uh, indeed, news hit last month that Ben Emerson, uh, and by the way, Emerson's formal title is that he is the UN's, quote, Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms While Countering Terrorism, end quote. Only the UN can come up with that long of a title for their, for their people. Uh, anyway, Emerson had released his report on the use of UAVs in counterterrorism operations uh, just last month, uh, and that report had been months in the making. Uh, it's worth noting that prior to the conclusion of his investigation, Emerson had already showed his hand regarding his views of American UAV operations. And I'll just read a quote from March of 2013. Quote, I'm not aware of any state in the world that currently shares the United States' expansive legal perspective that it is engaged in a global war. That is to say, a non-international armed conflict with Al-Qaeda and any group associated with Al-Qaeda, wherever they are to be found, that would therefore lawfully entitle the United States to take action involving targeted killing wherever an individual is found, end quote. And then there's this comment that he made a month later on the policy side of the, of the matter, where he said, quote, the consequence of drone strikes has been to radicalize an entirely new generation. Through the use of drones, you may win the immediate battle you're, wa you're waging against this particular faction or that particular faction, but you are losing the war in the longer term, end quote. So this, these were Emerson's views before he had uh, actually released his report. So with statements like this, I fully expected Emerson's report to be rather opinionated with respect to American UAV strikes. As I was reading it, though, I was struck by the tone and approach of a lengthy section in the report titled Principal Areas of Legal Controversy. On these issues as a whole, rather than dismissing the American perspective on these strikes, Emerson asserted, and I'm quoting from the conclusion here, quote, the special rapporteur identifies herein a number of legal questions on which there is currently no clear international consensus, end quote. 
So just juxtapose the UN report and what I just read from it with a report that came out a short while later, Amnesty International's Will I Be Next? U.S. Drone Strikes in Pakistan, uh, which Amnesty says is based on research into nine of the 45 strikes that occurred in northern Waziristan between January of 2012 and August of 2013. That report, as you can imagine, was decidedly more judgmental uh, and went so far as to say that U.S. UAV strikes in Pakistan may constitute war crimes. Uh, since the release of that report, experts both on Pakistan and on UAVs generally have pointed out several significant flaws with AI's analysis, and we can get more into that later if you want. Uh, so suffice it to say the debate goes on, and it has been going on for some time along these lines. Are UAV strikes legal, and are they effective? So with that, I thought I would now move to giving a brief 30,000-foot overview of the paper that we recently published at CSP on the subject of UAVs and the use of force abroad. Now, as a national security organization, we took a particular interest in how UAVs have been deployed to deliver force or to support the delivery of force against foreign targets overseas. Uh, we were interested not only in the debate surrounding the use of UAVs, but also what the trends may be in this area. So we undertook to publish a paper that introduces interested policymakers and analysts to the range of opinions on one, the legality of the UAV program, and two, the policy advisability of it. Uh, throughout the paper, we also examine the trends in UAV technology, law, and policy, again, dealing solely with foreign targets overseas. The overall goal here was to provide readers with a snapshot of analysis in these areas using interviews with primary sources uh, as well as secondary source research from across the opinion spectrum. So folks from Heritage, from Human Rights First, from uh, the academic world, uh, retired military folks who have firsthand experience using these things, uh, etc. I should note that the paper did not address the use of UAVs within the United States, uh, nor did it address the use of UAVs to target American citizens who happen to have joined foreign terrorist organizations. Those are both rich topics. You can have entire hearings on those subjects, and they have, uh, but those subjects are not within the scope of this study. So what exactly did we find? Just first a quick note on technology. Uh, we learned that there are significant trends taking place in the development of UAV technology relevant to their use for ISR purposes uh, in support of lethal force and for lethal force itself. These trends include a continuing demand for UAVs for ISR and munitions deployment, uh, the extension of the geographic range of UAVs, and that gets into what you saw a few months back with the carrier landing, uh, UAV designs incorporating greater levels of autonomy, which we'll get into a little more later, the increasing precision and maneuverability through innovations such as smaller lightweight UAVs with smaller munitions, uh, and finally, increasing proliferation of UAV technology both to state and non-state actors with potential dual-use capabilities between ISR and weapons deployment. ISR, by the way, is uh, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. So from technology, and after we explore those technology trends and where all of that may be going, we move on to the section on law. So for this section, we began with international law on the use of force, looking at the options both on, sorry, looking both at the opinions on compliance with the law and future direction of the law. Some of you probably already know that international law dealing with force can be divided into two areas. Uh, use ad bellum, which is Latin for uh, roughly speaking, laws governing when a nation may resort to war, and use in bello, or laws governing how a nation must conduct itself during a war once that war has commenced. On use ad bellum, we saw that the Obama administration argues that the use of UAVs abroad complies with use ad bellum, asserting that UAV strikes are consistent with the right to self-defense, that the decision to use force is both necessary and proportionate, and is in response to an imminent threat posed by terrorist organizations. Some scholars agree with this, while others argue that the administration is changing the traditional understanding of what constitutes an imminent threat. Scholars also agree on whether a state has a legal right to exercise self-defense against non-state actors inside the territory of a state that did not itself carry out an attack, and on whether the consent of such a state is required before action can be taken. Uh, I think we're all aware that the question of whether Pakistan uh, has ultimately consented to UAV strikes on its territory is a topic of much conversation in the literature and indeed in recent weeks uh, and certainly came up frequently in the course of interviews conducted for this study. Uh, so this raises the question, uh, 
Could the technological capabilities of UAVs bring about changes in international law on when a country can use force? Here we get into some trend assessment. Based on interviews and a survey of the literature, the study identifies three outlooks on the development of use ad bellum trends relative to unmanned aerial vehicles. There's the view that use ad bellum needs to ultimately be adjusted to account for UAVs in a way that tempers their use. There's the view that current use ad bellum is really all that's needed, although depending on who you ask, current use ad bellum either should allow for or restrict UAV use on its own terms. And finally, there's the view that current use ad bellum principles are inadequate to address terrorism generally and need to be expanded to address that threat. Next, within the legal section, we move on to the question of whether the United States is engaged in armed conflict. If it is, then the use in bello or laws of war apply. Again, there's a range of opinion here as to whether we're using UAVs in the context of an armed conflict. Uh, this is really where we get into the debate about the concept of so-called hot battlefields, meaning can we apply the laws of war, say, outside of Afghanistan, where everyone acknowledges that we're in the midst of a genuine armed conflict. There are lots of different opinions here, and if you read the paper, you'll, you'll see the range of them. I'm not going to go through them here, though, in the interest of time. Um, assuming we are in an armed conflict, that gets us into whether the United States is following the laws of war. The laws of war being necessity, distinction, proportionality, and humanity. While the Obama administration and many scholars assert that the use of UAVs complies with all these rules, and indeed some argue that use in bellow requires the use of UAVs given their precision levels relative to other weapons available, others of course disagree. On the question of whether UAV technology advancements will yield trends in the use and bellow side of the law, scholars in this study focus primarily on two things. First, the effect of UAV technology on requirements concerning civilian casualties, and second, the effect of increasing autonomy of UAVs on the use and bellow. On these points, experts noted that advances in UAV technologies are likely to catalyze and you right? Okay. Uh, experts noted that advances in UAV technologies are likely to catalyze an ever-increasing expectation that as the technology gets more precise, there ought to be fewer and fewer civilian casualties as a result. In other words, that proportionality standard will be applied to a much greater degree with the growth in precision technology. Also, significant advances in UAV autonomy have prompted some to call for international laws banning the development of, quote, fully autonomous weapons capable of selecting targets without any human involvement at all. On domestic laws governing the use of force with respect to UAVs, the paper looked at three select issues. First, the question of whether UAV strikes comply with the terms of the 2001 Authorization for the Use of Military Force, or AUMF. Two, whether UAVs trigger the War Powers Resolution, requiring, which would require congressional authorization for the use of force. This was a major issue, you might, you might recall, during the uh, debate over our intervention in Libya back in 2011. And three, whether there ought to be a separate judicial entity, referred to by some as a drone court, uh, to conduct judicial oversight over UAV strikes, whether before the fact or after the fact. Again, there were a range of opinion on all of these issues. Uh, additional trends, or in some cases, trends that some were hoping for, uh, that, that were discussed further in this paper as far as the future of this on the law side of things include the assertion that the United States ultimately will and really should move back to using to viewing terrorism as more of a law enforcement problem rather than a war fighting matter. Uh, there is the view that the United States will continue to be criticized for its use of UAVs outside of hot battlefields, but over time the terrorist threat will continue to require their use. And there's a view that UAVs will continue to play a critical role in assisting allied governments with territorial denial to jihadist organizations, which could have legal implications. So that is kind of the overview of the legal side of this endeavor. Uh, and so from the debates and trends concerning law, we then move on to an overview of what the policy debates and trends have been. Um, although UAV strikes against terrorist targets have eliminated leadership and other key figures in Al-Qaeda and its associated forces, including quite recently, Three common policy objections tend to persist when you talk to people who genuinely do not favor the use of these things. The first one that's most common is what many people refer to as this concept of blowback. 
this idea that UAV strikes create resentment on the ground in the places where they're used, which ultimately sort of fuel recruiting efforts of Al-Qaeda and their associated forces, and also blowback globally, which is to say it creates a certain level of resentment amongst our allies, which could, in the view of some, affect their willingness to cooperate with us on counterterrorism efforts. Then there's the uh, off-sited argument that UAVs create, let's call it a, a dehumanization of warfare on t really two levels. First, in terms of removing the UAV pilot from the physical battle. And secondly, in terms of government willingness to resort to force, absent national deliberation that would otherwise govern a decision of whether or not we should, in fact, deploy force overseas. And finally, there's the argument that as other nations acquire UAVs, the manner in which the US uses UAVs could encourage other countries to use them in ways in which we would disagree, right? So sort of the concern of, uh, I learned it by watching you, right? So from the policy debate, we move on to possible policy trends. And we really came up with four that sort of stood out in this paper. First, there was this projection um, for increasing scrutiny of UAV, force, uh, UAV use in the force context, followed by the public's eventual recognition of national security benefits of UAVs. Uh, many folks who I spoke with or, or read from uh, call for some sort of it's called a normative framework, whether it be that a treaty or something less binding like a code of conduct, something of that nature, to govern the use of UAVs in light of proliferation concerns. There is the projection that UAVs will prompt a new paradigm for the use of force that falls short of fully formed armed conflict. And finally, there is the call for the US to be held accountable for when other nations using intelligence provided by American UAVs carry out force that results in civilian casualties even when the United States did not itself carry out that attack. Um, there's a very interesting piece making this argument by a guy named Mike Zenko over at the Council on Foreign Relations, and I talk about that more in the paper. Uh, but that, that indeed is a, an argument that he's made several times. Uh, finally, the study briefly explores the policy implications of more restrictions on UAV use. Uh, among those interviewed, there's concern that curtailing or eliminating UAV use would be a major setback for American national security and would actually endanger civilians on the ground by exposing them to more indiscriminate violence, either from terrorist organizations already in the area or from allied governments of ours who would feel compelled to intensify combat against these groups absent our own UAV support in this regard. There's also concern uh, that a drone court were it to be established would effectively end the UAV program. Uh, as such an institution, it simply not be designed uh, not be institutionally qualified to keep pace with the fleeting nature of intelligence that often drives these things. So I'll just conclude by saying the study is not meant to be a comprehensive look at all of the issues and arguments that are out there concerning the use of UAVs to carry out lethal force, but it is intended to be a primer of sorts uh, to help readers understand where we are on this question and, of course, where we may be headed. And I don't think the debate is going away anytime soon.